Good morning everyone or good evening. Um, this is the study number four in our series on the Holy Spirit and we're continuing from study number three. Um, we're going to begin today from the book Acts of the Apostles um, by Ellen White, The Gift of the Spirit. And there's some really good material in this chapter, chapter 5, which begins on page 47. We're just going to pick out a few uh, points which will help us to see the importance of the work of the Holy Spirit. So let's begin on page 47, where we read, before offering himself as the sacrificial victim, he instructed his disciples regarding a most essential and complete gift. This is Jesus, which he was to bestow upon his followers. Now I really want to emphasize that the Holy Spirit is a most essential and complete gift. We cannot finish the work of God without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the time of the latter rain. So that time is rapidly approaching and God's people should be asking and praying for the divine spirit, for the Holy Spirit to guide them and to prepare them for what is coming. And we read some really good statements on this, that it's through the Holy Spirit that we are prepared to meet our Lord. I'll just uh, mention uh, one or two here. Um, from Last Day Events 187, where it says, The Holy Spirit seeks to abide in each soul. If it is welcomed as an honoured guest, those who receive it will be made complete in Christ. So that is the work of the Holy Spirit, to make us complete and ready. Now, Christ personally isn't going to make us complete and ready by his divine presence here upon this earth because he's busy in the heavenly sanctuary, but he's communicating to us through the divine spirit as his representative. And because he's com communicating through the divine spirit, that's why the Holy Spirit is such a essential and complete gift. Okay, let's read on. He, um, he instructed his disciples regarding a most essential and complete gift which he was to bestow upon his followers. The gift that would bring within their reach the boundless resources of his grace. And Christ's boundless resources is available to us through the agency of the Holy Spirit, the communication that takes place through the Holy Spirit. Because Christ is more limited now because he has taken humanity. And so he works through the Holy Spirit to do certain things. I will pray the Father, he said, and he shall give you another comforter, that, you may, that he may abide with you forever. So Christ was a comforter to those disciples. But now Jesus was saying that he would give another comforter. And we have one comforter, which is Jesus, and we have another comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, which is two comforters. And the Father himself is a comforter also. 
We don't normally think of him as being a comforter, but he's totally in harmony with the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and therefore he too must be a comforter. Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive. So the world doesn't receive the impressions and the work of the Holy Spirit because they don't recognize the voice of God speaking to them through the invisible agency of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, Many church people don't recognize the importance of the Holy Spirit either. Now why can't the world receive? Because it seeth him not. What you can't see, you don't believe in. That's what some people are like. But can we see the air? Yes, we can. Can we believe in the air? Yes, we can. So it's the same with the Holy Spirit. We can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when we have a good prayer season, I have often noticed this divine presence is there. And you have this beautiful feeling of peace, of love, of contentment, of resignation to God, of humbleness, and a peaceable spirit when the Holy Spirit has been present at a group prayer or even an individual prayer at different times too. So, but we will know him, but you will know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. And so the Holy Spirit was dwelling with the disciples and I'm sure the Holy Spirit had been dwelling in them too but they weren't aware so much of the Holy Spirit because they were looking to Jesus very much as their comforter and when it came to Pentecost that really changed because Jesus' visible appearance his visible presence was taken from them and they were left to depend on the invisible presence of the Holy Spirit. But because he dwelled in them, then they were aware that he was working for them. And when you read the book of Acts, you'll see so much that the book of Acts is the... It says the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. But we could say that the book of Acts is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Directing. Directing the Apostles. Because you see again and again through the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit told us to go here. The Holy Spirit said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work that I have for them to do, and so on. The Holy Spirit led out the Holy Spirit this and the Holy Spirit that. And it's very much a book of the acts of the Holy Spirit directing the apostles. And A.T. Jones um, brings out this point in a very good article of his. Let's continue now. The Saviour was pointing forward to the time when the Holy Spirit should come to do a mighty work as his representative. So, Jesus is here and the Holy Spirit was to be his representative. The Holy 
Holy Spirit was to do a work as Christ's representative. And in normal English, when someone is a representative of someone else, it's not the same person. And many people are taking up this idea that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are identical. But Jesus said, I will give you another comforter, even the Spirit of Truth. And we see that here it says that Jesus that the Holy Spirit would be the representative of Jesus. And a representative is not the same person. Now, if I go away, for instance, if I go away overseas and my wife stays at home, doesn't come with me, and someone rings up and wants to know something, then she will act as my representative. But does that make her me? No, it doesn't. We're two separate beings. We're two separate beings, but she is being my representative. But that doesn't make her me. Now, in a marriage, the two are said to be one, aren't they? The two are said to be one, and so... Two people in a good marriage are very much in tune with each other and they act to a large extent in the same way as each other in a given situation if, they, if it's a good marriage. Now, the way the three divine beings work in heaven is the same. They all work act in unison with each other, they cooperate with each other. Sometimes it's hard to tell who is actually acting and who is um, taking a more backseat approach. Sometimes one is very active and sometimes another is active. Sometimes it's very plain from the scriptures who is the main one acting, but we can be sure that they're all acting in harmony with each other, even though they're doing different things. So let's not get confused because God created marriage to be a picture of, or one reason he created marriage is to be a picture of the relationship between different um, beings in heaven, between God the Father, between Jesus, between the Holy Spirit, and also to show the work of the angels too, how they cooperate like a family situation as well. Now, let's continue from page 47 of the Gift of the Spirit chapter. The evil that had been accumulating for centuries was to be resisted by the divine power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is described as the divine power. And that is God's way of resisting. That is God's way of resisting the um, evil that is in the world. Now, if we don't acknowledge the work of the Holy Spirit, if we don't acknowledge the importance of the Holy Spirit, as the one who is going to work for us to resist evil, then we will miss out on what we really need. The evil that, had, that has been accumulating for centuries 
was to be resisted by the divine power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go on to another factor with the Holy Spirit which is very important too. The disciples after Pentecost had the ambition to reveal the likeness of Christ's character and to labour for the enlargement of his kingdom. And this was done under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was directing too, of course, but the Holy Spirit was the one who was um, hands-on in the work on the earth itself. With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Under their labours were added to the church chosen men who, receiving the word of truth, consecrated their lives to the work of giving to others the hope that filled their hearts with peace and joy. They could not be restrained or intimidated by threatenings. The Lord spoke through them, and as they went from place to place, the poor had the gospel preached to them, and miracles of divine grace were wrought. So mightily can God work when men give themselves up to the control of the Spirit. So when we give ourselves up to the control of the Spirit, who is Christ's agent to take the message to the world, then these mighty manifestations of divine power will take place in these last days. Now, let's go to page 49. The promise of the Holy Spirit is not limited to any age or any race. So the promise of the Holy Spirit... is not limited to any point in history or to any race which is an interesting uh, principle to understand I also heard someone who gave a different, slightly different understanding of this and probably quite a few other people have that. It says the Holy Spirit is not limited to any age or any race. So also it can mean that the Holy Spirit can be given to someone like John the Baptist when he was still in the womb. So when John the Baptist was in the womb, the Holy Spirit was working on him there. And the baby that Elizabeth was carrying jumped in the womb when she came in contact with Mary uh, when Mary was with child Jesus. So, also we have the child preachers during the time of the Reformation uh, from Sweden, I think it was, from memory. And these were young people who because the, um, the mature people were threatened with imprisonment and with uh, harsher measures than that, torture and that, they were unable to preach the gospel freely. 
The Lord used these child preachers to preach the gospel there. And that's not the first time that's happened either. So, the promise of the Holy Spirit is not limited to any age or any race. Christ declared that the divine influence of his Spirit was to be with his followers unto the end. Now some people think that because it says his Spirit, that it is Christ himself. But Christ can send the Holy Spirit, or it can say his Spirit, without it being Christ, of course, because I can say that my wife is, as a representative of me, is my wife. She's my wife, but that doesn't mean to say that it's me, because we're two different people. So. It says here, Christ declared that the divine influence of his spirit, the spirit which he is using, we can say the uh, work of my worker or of his worker. So you were saying of a friend who was a builder, for instance, you can say the... Um, the work, the building work of his worker. And so he is the worker of the other man, the boss. He is a worker, but that doesn't mean to say that it's the boss working. So this is a misunderstanding of the English language. And Ellen White was English. She, this book, Acts of the Apostles has not been translated from another language. It is written in English. She is aware of English. And she worded it this way so that we would understand that there are more than one divine being, that there are three. And she comes out and says there are three divine beings. So, this is what, it's, what it is. Now, Christ declared that the divine influence of his spirit was to be with his followers unto the end. From the day of Pentecost to the present time, the Comforter has been sent to all who have yielded themselves fully to the Lord and his service. To all who have accepted Christ as a personal saviour, the Holy Spirit has come as a counsellor, sanctifier, guide and witness. The more closely believers have walked with God, the more clearly and powerfully have they testified of their Redeemer's love and his saving grace. The men and women who through the long centuries of persecution and trial enjoyed a large measure of the presence of the Spirit in their lives have stood as signs and wonders in the world. Before angels and men, they have revealed the transforming power of redeeming love. So what a wonderful blessing, the divine presence of the Holy Spirit is in our lives. Let's go to page 50 now. And the first full um, paragraph. The lapse of time has wrought no change in Christ's parting promise to send the Holy Spirit as his representative. It is not because of any restriction on the part of God 
that the riches of his grace do not flow earthward to men. If the fulfillment of the promise is not seen as it might be, it is because the promise is not appreciated as it should be. So God is not holding back the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is available. The Holy Spirit is available to his people. The reason why we don't receive the more of the Holy Spirit is because we don't appreciate. We are not appreciating. We can't, we can't direct the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is to direct us. Now, when we are pliable, when we are humble, when we are teachable in the hands of the Holy Spirit, that is the time when the Holy Spirit can use us the most. So, you can't be a grumpy, rebellious person and then expect to receive the great gift of the Holy Spirit. We must learn to appreciate and to conform to the guidance and to the, the convictions of the Holy Spirit when they come to us in order to receive more power of the Holy Spirit. So there's no restriction on God's part concerning the Holy Spirit. The restriction is in our What's the word? We should be like clay that can be moulded by the Holy Spirit. If we're not pliable, if we're not available, if we're not interested, then we are not appreciating the greatest gift that God can give and therefore we receive less of the Holy Spirit. Remember the last study where we said that the Holy Spirit is given in proportion to our, our desire for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given in proportion to our faith. Holy Spirit is given in proportion to whether we will utilize the gifts of the Spirit. So these are the things that we must consider if we want to receive more of the Holy Spirit and every Christian should be wanting to receive more of the Holy Spirit. If the fulfillment of the promise is not seen as it might be, it is because the promise is not appreciated as it should be. If all were willing, all would be filled with the Spirit. Wherever the need of the Holy Spirit is a matter little thought of, there is seen spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, spiritual declension and death. Whenever minor matters occupy the attention, the divine power which is necessary for the growth and prosperity of the church and which would bring all other blessings in its train is lacking, though offered in infinite plenitude. So God is offering us the blessings the growth, the prosperity of the church and other blessings, when that's lacking, it's because we are not appreciating the gift. God is offering in infinite. Plentitude.
In other words, he's offering infinite plenty. Okay, let's continue on page 50. Since this is the means by which we are to receive power, why do we not hunger and thirst for the gift of the Spirit? So do we hunger? Do we thirst for the gift of the Spirit like we do for food? We should be. We should be. We should be hungering and thirsting for the gift of the Spirit. Why do we not talk of it, pray for it, and preach concerning it? Well, you don't hear a lot of preaching on the Holy Spirit, and Satan has lifted up a standard against the Holy Spirit of late because he knows that his time is running out. He knows the latter rain is coming. He's trying to confuse people concerning the Holy Spirit. The Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who serve him than parents are to give good gifts to their children. For well, the daily baptism of the Spirit, every worker should offer his petition to God. Every worker. That includes everybody who is a Christian, because we're all to be workers. Companies of Christian workers should gather to ask for special help, for heavenly wisdom, that they may know how to plan and execute wisely. Especially should they pray that God will baptize his chosen ambassadors in mission fields with a rich measure of his spirit. The presence of the spirit with God's workers will give the proclamation of truth a power that not all the honor or glory of the world can give. So that's what we need. We need that gift of the Holy Spirit. Because you can preach all you like, but if there's no manifestation of the Holy Spirit to bring the truth home, it will all be in vain. Let's go to page 51 now. And here we read another important point about the Holy Spirit that we should be considering. And this is that the Holy Spirit is ready to help us in every emergency. Not just some emergencies, but in every emergency. Let's read it now. Page 51, Acts the Apostles. With the consecrated worker for God in whatever place he may be, the Holy Spirit abides. The words spoken to the disciples are spoken also to us. The Comforter is ours as well as theirs. It's really important. The comfort, the comfort is not just for the disciples in Christ's day. It's for us as well. The Spirit furnishes the strength that sustains striving, wrestling souls in every emergency. So we are to be sustained. By the presence of the Holy Spirit. In every emergency. 
when we're striving, wrestling, amid the hatred of the world and the realisation of our own failures and mistakes. And that can be very devastating. Hatred for the truth can be devastating to us. And especially for those working in difficult places. In sorrow and affliction, when the outlook seems dark and the future perplexing, and we feel helpless and alone, these are the times. Those are the times when the outlook seems dark, the future perplexing, we feel helpless and alone, these are the times when an answer to the prayer of faith, the Holy Spirit brings comfort to the heart. So what a wonderful blessing the Holy Spirit is. And you take Paul and Silas in that Philippian prison, Philippi, and how the Holy Spirit worked for them in that very discouraging situation. And what a mighty manifestation of God was there to be seen when they raised their voices in prayer and in song and in rejoicing while suffering extreme pain. The bottom of the page now. It is not essential for us to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Spirit is the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth which proceeds from the Father. It is plainly declared regarding the Holy Spirit that in his work of guiding men into all truth, he shall not speak of himself. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men have fanciful views. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a human construction on them. So that's certainly happening today. But the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church. And that is happening today too. Regarding such mysteries which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. The office of the Holy Spirit is distinctly specified in the word of Christ. When he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. If the sinner responds to the quickening influence of the Spirit, he will be brought to repentance and aroused to the importance of obeying the divine requirements. So the Holy Spirit is to bring us to Christ. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. But he has other work to do as well. So let's go now to page 53. And the first full paragraph. From the beginning, God has been working by his Holy Spirit through human instrumentalities for the accomplishment of his purpose in behalf of the human race. This was manifest in the lives of the patriarchs, to the church in the wilderness also in the time of Moses, God gave his good spirit to instruct them. And in the days of the apostle, he wrought mightily for his church through the agency of the Holy Spirit. And it talks about the dark ages, etc., etc. Let's go to the bottom of the page. 
and to die. To die. God is still using his church to make known his purpose in the earth. Today the herod, heralds of the cross are going from city to city and land to land, preparing the way for the second advent of Christ. The standard of God's law is being exalted. The Spirit of the Almighty is moving upon men's hearts. And those who respond to its influence become witnesses of God and his truth. In many places, consecrated men and women may be seen communicating to others the light that was made plain to them, the way of salvation through Christ. And as they continue to let their light shine, as did those who were baptised with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, they receive more and still more of the Spirit's power. Thus, the earth is to be lightened with the glory of God. Now, the lightening of the earth with the glory of God is going to be done at the end of time. And in Christ Object Lessons, the last chapter, there's a lot of information and understanding to be got from there. But this enlightenment, which is really a quote from Isaiah 60, verse 1 and onwards, and we know in Revelation 18, and verse 1 and onwards to this great enlightenment which um, the prophet here, Alan White, is referring to, the, that the earth would be lightened with his glory, that is being referred to there, and this enlightenment will come through the work of the Holy Spirit working through people. It'll be the Holy Spirit working through the human agencies. And this is Revelation 18 angel is the loud cry angel. And it's the fourth angel in the sequence. And this angel adds his power to the third angel, which brings the loud cry or the latter rain. And this is coming very soon as we sing the events in preparation for Christ's coming on the side of the wicked happening very fast. It's harder to see where God's people are coming up to the mark, but surely here and there they are. And soon we will see the fulfilment of these promises in the world today. So we'll stop there and we'll continue in number five soon. So let us not disregard the Holy Spirit, let us be mindful that we will be tested when we come into the presence of the Holy Spirit, tested about our willingness to change our lives and to conform to the image of Christ. Thank you.